Hi everybody and welcome to Season 3, Episode 27 of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry Podcast with me, Philip Heidson and Darren McAnthony, Chairman and Co-Owner of Peterborough United. How are you doing, Darren? I'm good, pal. I'm good. Good weekend. I um, Obviously, we had the game on Saturday and then yesterday I took my daughter to the men's training camp for the US national team. Mm-hmm. Uh, good pal of mine, Anthony Hudson, is like the man in charge at the moment. Um, so he invited me down. Meet the players, the staff, the technical director, CEO of men's you know, national soccer, the technical director, a Belgian guy, great guy, down at the Omni here in Florida. So it was really fascinating because I've known the manager for five years. He did a podcast on coaching and he reached out to right. me four or five years ago. Could I be a guest? And, and he said it like helped him immensely. You know, and he ended up working in the MLS. Then he got a job with the mm-hmm. 21s. Then he joined the national team at Qatar. And now he's kind of like, he's, he's holding the job, obviously, until they... You know, and I've said, obviously, I think America, if they get a striker, they'll be a very dangerous uh, mm-hmm. prospect in the 26 World Cup over here. So things are changed. But yeah, it was, it was, that was fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the game tonight. I think you're going as well. They're playing yeah, we were just saying so. off, Mike, that we're both uh, yeah. heading down there tonight. So yeah, it'd be they, interesting. Yeah, they invited me over and whatever else. But I didn't put any pictures up because I didn't want people going, oh, he's just, uh, just the next manager of Peterborough. He's looking at whatever else. But, no. <laughs> but, uh, but funny enough, it's mad, isn't it? Some agents out here have reached out to me you know, about, you know, if you ever need a manager or whatever else, there's more and more, you know, uh, British managers over here and whatever. It's, it, it, it's mad, really, isn't it? So, Ted Lasso for the posh. Yeah, I mean, it was my birthday on Friday, and I was, it's really funny. I was showing my missus. I was like, I get these birthday messages off agents, you know, and it's like a couple of them just happy birthday, have a great day. No mm-hmm. problems. One of them's like, happy birthday. Hope you're well. By the way, I've got the manager for you if you're looking for a manager at the end. Of the- and it's just like, just stop at the happy birthday. Like seriously, you know, <laughs> right. it just it, it, it looks a bit convoluted otherwise, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, really, really, really good weekend. Um, you want to talk about Saturday? Was there a big game on Saturday? Yeah. It was a big game on Saturday. So uh, you beat Derby two 0 and yeah. um, what one point off? Not that you play, not that you table watch, but one point off the playoffs. I think you know when you're living on that, always next result, next result, next result, next result. Um, yeah, it was really good. It was on ESPN Plus. So, because there was no games, whatever else. So, I didn't have to use my streamer. I didn't realize that. I'd have watched it because City yeah. didn't have a game. Yeah, so where, where, when is an international break on? There's a big game in League One. They, mm. they had three of them on, and Posh was one of them. So, uh, yeah, I shut my streamer down and put it on ESPN Plus. So, it was good. But, um, yeah, great crowd, great atmosphere. Good that I wasn't there. Um, you know, spoke to all the staff on Friday and just said, look, you know, have a great game. Because usually those kind of games, you get complaints, there's issues, there's this, there's mm-hmm. that. And I'm just like, look, ignore all the noise. You're going to have a full stadium tomorrow. You know, that's what it's all about. That's what we want. And, and to be fair, the fans give themselves credit because the game started and we, we, were, we weren't good the first half. We'd like, I don't think we got in our box. Derby pressed us, dominated possession. It didn't really hurt us. I don't think Derby really made much of a mm-hmm. save. But they were in complete control of the game. And the fans... Although, you know, in the past, they've kind of like got irritated or whatever. They stayed with the team. Now, the words I said to Darren Ferguson afterwards, I went my usual five and a half mile sweaty walk afterwards and he rang me. And I said to him, the players can take great credit winning the game, but you won that game. Sometimes mm-hmm. you have to give credit to management and staff for changing the game because of the changes they make. As much as you'll criticize them, when, why didn't you make subs? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? The art of good football management on Saturday won us the football game because... From the first half to the second half, you could see we had no balance. Ronnie Edwards was a massive miss. The manager was telling me in the build-up to the game, it was made for Ronnie. The way Derby played and whatever else and coming out with the ball and getting us going. And he's away with the England under-20s, which is a, I'll tell you about that in a second. That's another like funny thing. And you're drafting in centre-backs to play there on the left side of, the, of, of, of the fence. And it's just, there's no balance. We had no balance in that first half. So we lost every 50-50. So the gaffer put Dan Butler in, who's a left back, but he played him left side at centre half, went to mm-hmm. a three to give us balance down that side with Ogbetta. H wasn't having his greatest game. He's been brilliant for us, but he's a young player. They have great games and shit games. So he brought Paku on there with a bit more energy. And we just, we started winning 50 50s. We imposed ourselves on the game. I think, I don't want to say the player shitted in the first half because that would be unfair. I just think the occasion, everything else. I think mm-hmm. it was kind of like at half time, the manager was probably like, it's now or never. It's like now or fucking never. Like, go out and win the fucking game, you know, or, or what else. And I think the players realized 
if these players realised how good they were, they would win every mm-hmm. game. That's that's the frustrating thing. Really, really good squad. We've said it since the start of the season. Like in no way, shape, or form should we be on a chase. We know we're what we should be chasing right now. And they went out and they dominated the second half. Yes, Derby had opportunities. Nothing you, you, you would say was like we had the best opportunities. We've hit the post twice. We've had chances to score. Even after two 0 Ricky should have scored to you know make it three. Everybody, El Beta was fantastic. I have to give credit, Norburn and Taylor in the middle there, anchoring everything was just like the energy. They they stepped up a level. They were getting beaten in the first half in that area of the park. They mm-hmm. stepped it up a level. Clark Harris is like a different player the last four or five games. His he, he looks fit, he looks strong, he looks hungry, he looks interested. Better than that, because you're always going to get goals even when he's not playing well. He's holding the ball up better than I've ever seen. Whatever he's doing in training, keep at it. Keep at it for the next like, 11 games or whatever else, because he's, he's unplayable. He's coming up against three center halves most games and he's winning the battle, which is very difficult with one striker against three. So Joe Ward, fair play to him having a disastrous game, but he doesn't shirk from that. And even after the game, he's like, oh, I didn't play well. But you're going to get that. Like, not everybody's, yeah. you know, the big game, you're not going to get your best players always. It just happens sometimes. But, you know, if you get seven or eight of them playing well and a few of them not so well, you can win the game with the squad we have. Well, you can't have yeah, you're a... You're still them Yeah, you, well, you know, and nobody hit. And I would say that nobody hit. And I've, you know, I've given, you know, Nathan Thompson, Frankie, a few of those players, you know, are going over at times this season, and deservedly so. But I have to give credit where credit's due. You know, they're, they're coming to their best football at the right time. You know, they're all stepping up. They're, they're doing what they need to do. They're, they're, you can see it in them on the pitch. Norburn's played a big part since he's come back from injury because he's just a leader. He's, was he still finding his fitness feet? Maybe he's not playing a the top level he wants to, it would take 10, 15 games yeah. to do that. He's making a difference. You can see it just in, on the park, the presence, do you know what I mean? So all those things are working. But look, it makes it interesting. The manager said it, there's eight games left. It's like a mini league for two spots. There's five clubs vying for two spots. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see. We, we wanted to make it interesting. We wanted to, you know, put some pride back in the performances. We wanted the fans to see, hey, we're not as bad as everyone says we are. We're not as bad as when everyone was writing obituaries after Cheltenham, you know, but it was, it's kind of like, and then people are saying, well, we don't win home games. Well, that's not true because we've beaten some good teams at home. We've beaten Shrewsbury at home. We've beaten Portsmouth at home. We've beaten Plymouth at home. We've now beaten Derby at home, you know, under the current gaffer. So sometimes headlines start writing themselves. They don't make any sense. Um, so, yes, it, it, whilst it's brilliant and that was really important to win, and that's a good team, Derby, full of experience. Um, There's going to be tougher tests ahead. You're playing teams who are mm-hmm. fighting for their lives. And and Forrest Green told everybody in England yesterday what I've always said. People look at fixtures and go, oh, that's an automatic three points. And as we saw at Cheltenham, it's not. If you don't play to a level, you're going to get beaten by any team. Mm-hmm. And Forrest Green beat Sheffield Wednesday. Sheffield Wednesday, up until losing, I think, last week to Barnsley, were unbeaten for 25 games, yeah. you know, whatever else. And that, fair play, they've got a few injuries. But Forrest Green, who haven't won since the old King died, you know, I think they got their first win on the Duncan Ferguson. I mean, that's a magnificent result. And it just shows you at this time of the season, I'd hate to be a bookie because there's no, you, you, you know, you're putting your house on that. They're winning. Because I would imagine like yesterday, how, how odds on favourites for Sheffield Wednesday to win that game. Right, you'd put your house on that, wouldn't you? You would. But I would always say to people, with 10 games or less than 10, 10 games to go in any league, don't fucking dare put your house on shit because you're going to end up homeless. Like, and don't do it. Fighting. You know, people are fighting, right, as well. That's what we came across Hartlepool a couple of weeks ago, um, that when when relegation is on the line, I mean, there's one or two ways you can go. You either give up or you, you fight. So you got three, um, you got three ways to turn. You, that's a great example of Hartlepool thing, which you would put down as a banker. There's three, there's three ways to define things, and we saw it with Cheltenham. Cheltenham didn't have anything to play for. They're not going down. They're not going up. Mm. Um, so they're a dangerous animal because they've got nothing to lose. They've got nothing to gain, nothing to lose. And you think, oh, they're going to give up. No, nope. really, really dangerous animal. Then you've got teams vying for promotion. Suddenly they're playing with an anchor of pressure around their ankles. Mm-hmm. So they're not, you know, you know, some teams are just at it, like Ipswich are at it at the moment, yeah. winning every game, Plymouth are still doing it, you know. Sometimes the anchor starts weighing on you, you know. Uh, even when we won promotion a couple of years ago, you know, we should have beaten Donny at home to, to solidify. We didn't. We, 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 we gave away goals. We're then against Lincoln. Should we beat Lincoln? We're 3-0 down. The anchor is weighing on you, you know, so it's results, but we fought back. Um, and then there's the teams who are down there fighting for their fucking livelihoods to stay in the league. So they are three very different kind of 
situations you describe whenever you and we're playing all those teams we're playing teams up there we're playing teams down there we're playing teams with nothing to play for you have to be on it now for every game otherwise you're going to get Cheltenham result you know if you're on it you're going to get the derby result I know what we have I've been saying it a long time but it's now the players have to believe in themselves I hate using the word believe but I have to believe in themselves that they can beat anybody in the league they could play an inform Ipswich they could play an inform Plymouth and they, and they can beat them on any given day because we have the players and whatever to beat them. And I've been saying that for a long time. So as much as people are losing their shit, and, and rightly so with some of the criticism at times when we lose 3 nil at home, which has never happened for Peter United, um, you know, it's like, okay, we can either pile on and we can, including me, and we can have a go and we do whatever else, or we can kind of let the manager and the players go on with what they're doing. And we can just be there to support, like fluffers in a porn movie. Be there as best we can to support them. You know, get on our knees, do what we need to do and make sure they're all ready to go come showtime and, and, and let it play out. And that's the only thing you can do. So biggest thing for Saturday was keeping the crowd with you and they stayed with us throughout, you know, even when we weren't playing well and whatever else, you could just feel the fans are with the players and the players are with the fans. And I want that to maintain and stay the same. The staff are all in a good place. Just, just yeah. let them all get, let, let the three of them, I said it yesterday, somebody was going on about me, Randy, Jason, whatever. I'm like, it's not about our owners. It's not about us. It's not about me. As much as people think I have an ego, it's about the players, the fans, and the staff at the football club. Let the three of them just do their thing. That's it. Yeah, there's a big difference. Like, it makes a big difference when the fans, when someone makes a mistake, when the fans are encouraging them after that mistake versus when the fans are shouting at them after that mistake. 100% correct. And... We're all human beings and footballers are human beings. And you're going to see Lionel Messi make mistakes. You're going to see the best in the world make mistakes. Players at League One level are going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And, and as you hold people's feet to the fire, mistakes get made. Um, it's best not to, you know, make the mistake bigger than it is. Move on. You make a mistake, it's a goal, and there's 80 minutes left in a game. Mm-hmm. It's not that player's fault. Move on. People are fucking human beings. So let's see. It's fun. It's interesting. I've said this for weeks. It, 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 it's great being in that position where you just know your staff are all working well. You know, the football is going to be nine times out of ten really good to watch. Um, the fans are going to be pretty happy. Um, yeah, I've had a time machine and all of that, but we don't. So it is what it is. Well, you know? We've talked all season about confidence and momentum. And, um, you know, you're obviously getting that at the moment. What are the things that Darren can do or does to try and maximize the chances that that continues? I think he has a certain way he plays, as we know, and I just think it suits the players. In mm-hmm. defense of previous management, a large majority of the players were recruited for the previous manager and his style. And I think that works very well. And I, even the players we brought in suit his style now. You know what I mean? So, And I just think the players know what he wants from them. There's a clear message. There's a clear play this way. doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You've got to play that way. You've got to like dominate the board. You've got to like take control of a game. You've got to do this. You've got to score goals. You've got to like, you know, attack. You know, you've got to like, you know, don't sit back. Don't just run 12K in a game and be busy and end up losing. Like you have to get on top. And, and there's a clear message, you know, obviously the goalie and Obeta signings in January supplemented mm-hmm. and, and really added to the squad in a good way in, in some key areas. And he's getting the best out of some of the players who were struggling early on. And that's also a big change. And I think what's really important to notice as well is that Josh Knight didn't have a great game on Saturday. But God bless him. He was one of the first people on the pitch celebrating with his teammates. I love to see that. And that's why he's a proper guy. You know, he'd been playing very well before his red card on Saturday. He's left side of centre back. It's not his best position. He didn't have his best game. Didn't cost us anything. But to see him on the pitch celebrating afterwards, we all like to see that. But that's a genuine sign of a proper man because Mm -hmm. 11 people don't get you promoted you know it's usually 24 or 25 players plus about 10 members of staff so it's never just that one person you know and and to see that and to see players and and players have to realize that like a lot of them played in the under 21 game the other day and the under 21s didn't do well and we had a really good team out and the manager was angry with them he's saying to the players the seven eight of them were involved in our squad going you're going to be involved in this running you can't go out and play like that you have to be on it all the fucking time. And just because you're not in the 11 doesn't mean next week you're not going to be in the 11. And, and, and I think he's quite consistent in that way. 
You know what I mean? Like, you know, you get in, you get in on merit and you stay in. And, and some people will come into the squad, some people will come out. Another big shout out to Ben Thompson. He hasn't started a game on the Darren, but he comes on as a sub and he's probably one of the most professional substitutes I could ever, I've ever seen in all my years at Peterborough because some subs who are not involved come on and they're a bit milky. Yeah. He's never milky. He comes on, I think he came on a right wing back on Saturday. He's not a right wing back. He will, if you said to Ben Thompson, I want you to go and go, I want you to carry the water. I want you to do it. He's just a professional who will go on and he knows he's played really well by our football club and whatever he's, is asked of him, he's at it. Mm-hmm. Other players will have agents moaning. Why is he yeah. doing it? Why is he in the other tournaments? Why is he not playing? Why is he not? But, you know, Ben Thompson is just a professional. And maybe that's age. Maybe that's his, his upbringing. I don't know. But it's a credit to him to see players like that. You know, Joel Randall said to the manager, he wasn't on the bet, you know, the manager was saying, Joel's really good. You know, he didn't have a great under-21 game. He's been dominating in the 21s. He's been in and out of our squad. And he just said to the guy, look, just tell me what you need off me in the next six, seven weeks. I'll run through a brick wall. What do you need? Mm-hmm. I'll play in every under-21 game. I'm, I'm ready to be in the squad. What do you need? That's what you want to hear at the right time. What you don't want to hear is the player going, my agent needs to call you because I'm not involved. I need to think about the summer. We need everybody thinking about the same common goal. What's the common goal? Win as many games as possible and see where it takes us. And that's it. You, do you find that, because it's fascinating that, you, that the agents are the one doing the calling, Like, do you find that the agents have become the mouthpiece for the player, what, what used to be the player just having a conversation with the manager? Yes and no. A lot more nowadays, we talk about generations. Players 10, 15 years ago were different. You could give out to them. Mm-hmm. You could give out to a player. You asked the Trinity, McLean, Mikhail Smith, Boyd, Lee Tomlin. How many times the manager fucking the hairdryer was on them? I imagine there was a few hairdryers at half on a Saturday. But you can imagine the manager, like, if I remember once they all went out and Boydie fell down the stairs outside a nightclub after they won. And he came in with a bandage on his head the next day. And, of course, he got, you know, battered by the manager and everything else. But he still played two days later. He was fine. There's no agents ringing us up. There was no whatever else. You take your punishment. He probably got fined at the time. You take mm-hmm. your punishment. Paul Taylor showed up, not in the best shape, shall we say, to train him once. You know, and all the players knew it and protected him from the manager. But he still got the book thrown at him. And again, there was no agent on. You know, nowadays, an agent, guy, a player gets left out of a squad. You get an agent on straight away. Oh, you know, my player's played 10 minutes. My player's not been involved. You know, I miss sometimes some of the men from years gone by where players weren't the sense that they could take it. It's just, mm-hmm. again, I don't know if it's their fault. I just, we always talk about outside of football. It's a generational thing where young people yeah. are a little bit different now. They're a little bit more sensitive to everything, right? Do you think sometimes agents feel like they have to do that to earn their keep or to suggest that they're bringing no. value to their community? No, in defensive agents, and I know quite a few, they have their players on moaning every day. If a player's mm-hmm. not on the team, it's everyone else's fault. If a player plays and has a disastrous game, the agents, I know, because they're at the games, will ring me after and go, fuck me, I've had him on, moaning like whatever. He was a bag of shit, but I couldn't tell him he was a bag of shit, but he's blamed everyone else. He's blamed fucking everyone within the stadium bar his own performance. That's what players like. Agents have to stroke their egos constantly. Oh, you're, And sometimes I'll say to an agent, do yourself a favor. Tell your fucking player to pull his finger out and stop being a prick. He's going to have to look in the fucking mirror. It's on him. This isn't the manager. It's not the club. It's fucking him. And I'll bring up data and go, hey, you know, mm-hmm. you, your player, by the way, is running less than 7K in a game. That's like a fucking record. He wants to blame everyone else. Maybe if he lifted his fucking arse cheeks in front of one in front of the other, he might have actually done better. So mm-hmm. it's, it's always like that, you know. So I have to defend agents that they have to play at both sides. They have to stroke the egos, keep them calm. And then they have to, because the players will ask them to, reach out to management, reach out to me, you know, and, and they've got to navigate all of that. So God knows what it's like in the Premier League. For God, you know, players are on 300 grand a week. God knows what it's like. I'm talking about at our level, where players are on considerably a lot less money, you know, but... It's, it's just, it's a side of the game. But look, it's great we're winning. And again, more importantly, our, our, our under-18s, I think, won their 11th game in a row. It's 11 in a row. We beat Burnley 4-0. Burnley, who were top of the championship, Premier League club, big academy, 4-0. Yeah, at their place. So our, our academy, our 18s, I think we had seven first years in the team. First years, if people don't know what that is, look it up. These are, these are kids from the 16s and 17s who are stepping up. You usually get two or three years in the 18s. The first years, absolutely on fire. So the 16s, the 18s are just... Our, eight, our 16s beat Arsenal, I believe, 5-2. Arsenal. So, our, our, you know, look at me. I'm getting an erection just by the... Forget the Derby game, just by the you're, academy. 
you'll be sweating the uh, scouts away. Oh, uh, we are. We are. I'm, I'm having, you know, big meetings and talks the next few weeks when I go over to the UK about our next batch and coming through mm-hmm. and who's going to get pro contracts and first year deals and all of that. But uh, honest to God, Kieran Scarf, his staff, Jason, to be fair, because the whole academy, everyone there fucking, uh, I couldn't give them enough credit because it's all, everything they said would happen with the investments yeah. and everyone wanted to argue about our tent, our dome. <laughs> right. yeah, er, 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 everything we said was, uh, uh, it, it's just very exciting. And, and Scarfie's doing a dual role. He's basically, you know, part of the manager's first team staff. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's, so his staff are also holding, holding the place for him, you know, or, and he's still putting in the work. Credible, really. I mean, yeah, fucking, I'm, I'm so impressed by everything going on in that academy. I really am really, really impressed. And you can tell just now I'm not, yeah. We beat Derby, and it's great. Oh, one point mm-hmm. you're going on about one point, whatever. Forget all that. The academy, That's the future of the club. Oof, just exciting. Yeah, yeah, really, really psyched about all of that. So, um, and by the way, just a quick message because obviously we we had one of our most listened to episodes last week because it was obviously about the yellow block and about all the stuff, whatever else. I saw a tweet from someone saying the yellow block haven't posted or done a, a podcast or whatever else. Message to them: Don't stop what you're doing. Last week wasn't me trying to bury you and put you in the ground and you can never do a podcast again. I said it last week. I'm okay with people having podcasts. I'm okay with people having opinions. No misinformation, but I'm okay with opinions. I'm okay with DMAC out and fucking this, that, whatever. You know, Posh put up a birthday to me on Facebook. My missus said, you know, there was like 120 comments all nice and there was these two, de- she said, these two fucking deadbeats were like backwards and forwards with each other calling me corrupt, doing this, doing whatever. She says, I had to look one of them up. He's got a daughter. She's horse riding. She's like, my God, who who would sleep with these two fucking losers? That's where they're spending their time on somebody's happy birthday thread making comments. Look, and I said to her, they're entitled to their opinion. Give a fuck. Well, I couldn't give a fuck. At the end of the day, everyone likes the podcast, The Yellow Block. Get back out there, guys. Good or bad, do your show. And, you know, you lose your shit when we lose. You lose your shit in an exciting way when we win. Great. Just careful on the misinformation, that's all. Yeah, it's um, not about trying to take them down, is it? No, 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 no. no. No, I'm not trying to take anyone down. There's loads of fans. There's a fan called Del Boy who's absolutely battered me, you know, and, and you know, a lot of the time and, and come at me and angry about this, angry about But apparently we shared a birthday. So he was making that comment on Friday and whatever else. But I get it. Look, he's an old school fan who puts his money down to support his football club. I can't stop his opinion or his dislike mm-hmm. for me. And it's okay. That's not a problem. He was at the England game at the weekend as well. I respect as a football fan. He, he puts his dough in and he goes and he's been supporting the club probably longer than I've been around. He's never going to like me probably. That's okay too. I get it. You know what I mean? He's maybe not always going to believe me. That's okay too. That's fine. I can only be who I am and I can only do what I do. And But again, I'm, I'm not in a popularity contest. And I guess anyone out in a football club nine times out of ten is just not very popular. You know, and it's, it's just the way, unless you're winning Champions League and league titles. Yeah. And even then... Sure. You probably are on day one because they always hated the old guy. And right. then, uh, you right. know. I, yeah, you're right. I'm a, and then, uh, you're right. I, I'm on a really. Year. Yeah, I've had a good run, you know, for mm-hmm. like 17 years to be, have a lot of people, you know, put me in favor, you know, as opposed to, you know, the last year or whatever else, a couple of years with a bit younger people and maybe some older schools who just don't want drama and don't like seeing young people slate in the club. I get it. It, it. it is the way it is. I, I can't control it, I can't change it. I said last week my agenda is I stick to that. I'm going to carry on with the agenda and, and stuff like that has to just flow off the shoulders. And that's just the way it is. I think sometimes people's, because I think about this about City as well, you know, and, and people's frame of reference often be good, be, comes from the baseline for what they expect from their football club, comes from when they started to support the football club. So I think about City and I yep. think, you know, 4,000 crowds on a Tuesday night um, and it not being particularly attractive has been my baseline. And then you compare where you are and yes, we don't want to be in league two, but the infrastructure around the club, whereas somebody who comes and they start spotting you when you play in the premier league, you know, have a very different set of expectations of what the football club should be. And I think that plays yes. into some of it too. You know, you've Generational. had a good run, yeah, you've had a good run but somebody may start supporting posh when you're in the championship and are now thinking that that's the place that is your, given right right and therefore because you're not there it's because everyone's doing things wrong so if you look at it this way somebody who when i bought the club 17 years ago and somebody was three or four getting taken to the odd game with their family and they don't know suddenly they become a posh fan and that's the whole idea of your tickets mm-hmm. initiatives and everything else to get the next generation 
And so for the last 17 years, they've been a posh fan properly where they don't really know anything before. And they're just used to the Trinity, the goals, the promotions, yes, relegations, cups. And I get if there's a period of time where it's a down period, suddenly it turns a bit toxic for them. Because it's like, I'm not used to anything else. Right. Why aren't we Why aren't we winning leagues? Why aren't we doing whatever? This is and why I got the posh. Yeah, yeah, correct. And I, again, I'm not going to slag them off. That's just a football fan. Like, as football fans, there's so many different types of football fans. There's your 50-year-old season ticket holder or someone who's a season ticket for 50 years. And they just enjoy seeing their mates. They enjoy mm-hmm. seeing the old schoolers. They enjoy just going and having their meal and having their drink and watching the game. They don't care about the politics. They don't care about who the owners are. They don't care about who we sign in. They just want, it, it's, it's an experience immersing themselves on a match day. And then you've got younger fans who need the bragging rights with away fans. And they like getting involved in all the aggro. And the team has to be winning. And if it's not fucking winning, well, as a youngster, guess what a lot of young people do? They like to blame everyone else sometimes. So it's like, oh, it's everyone else's fault. So I get it. I've got children myself under the age of 18. I get it's a different generation. So like I said, I'm, I've got to, I said it last week, I have to get on with not getting involved in all the drama like that. And, and, and if people don't like me or want to call me a pikey or d that's fine. That's okay. You know, at the end of the day, it's not going to affect the job I've got to do, right? So let's talk about the international week. You referenced Ronnie Edwards in the under 20s. Um, yeah, so he played against Spain on Saturday. It, it, do you know what the killer is? The achievement that kid's made. He's won the under 19 World Cup with England last year. Their manager, I think, got promoted to the 20s. Straight away called Ronnie up. Um, if you look at the squad, the 23 players, I think there's three from the championship, like Alex Scott, players like that, that mm-hmm. ilk, worth 20, 25 million. And then you see, you see Arsenal, Man United, Liverpool, Chelsea, 90% of the squad's top five prem. It's not even bottom 10, it's top five. And then you see that one Peter B. United player. And it's like, there's, there's a bit of pride in there, you know, that he is playing at that level. He's in the team. You know, he's played one already. He didn't play the first game, played 90 minutes in the second game. The manager rates him, loves playing him. I think the England scouts, we had the 21s watching him a few weeks ago, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Lee Carsley, I think, came to watch him. And it was, unfortunately, it was, it was a Bolton game, I want to say. But I think what was interesting to them was that Ronnie's now playing left side of the centre-half. And as you know, those things are a premium for any centre-half yeah. that can play there, even without a natural left foot. So uh, I'm proud of him. He's just, he's, he, he is what he is. He's going to have a magnificent career. I, I'd love my, my club in the Prem to buy him. And um, I just, you know, he, and he's going to go away with the 20s. I think they've got a World Cup or Euros now, a championship coming up. And uh, it's uh, like watching Ivan play for England. It's going to be mm-hmm. it's going to be great watching that kid go and do what he's going to do in the game. So yeah, proud moment, but gutted to lose him for that one game. So how did that feel when Ivan walked on the pitch yesterday? Then magnificent, great, happy for him and his family. Um, I still say it was mad he didn't go to the World Cup. Um, absolute Simon Jordan said it on Talk Sport today. He is outside of Kane and Haaland, the best striker in the Premier League by a fucking mm-hmm. country mile with them. Um. Really, really proud moment. Delighted. Um, obviously, everyone losing their shit over. Peter, I've got a million quid. No, we fucking don't. That was the whole thing yesterday. But I just wish Southgate had given him longer than fucking, what was it, 10 minutes? Yeah. Mm. He didn't look out of place, by the way. And he wouldn't look out of place in international level. Well, he seems like a pretty ready-made backup, at least right now, for Harry Kane, you would have thought. All day long. All day long. If you're 1-0 down and you need to, and somebody's putting balls in your box, you should be on the pitch, mm-hmm. no matter what. Because he's the best defender you're ever going to have as well as an attacker. But delighted for Brentford. Delighted for him. First of many caps. Um, that boy's going to play for a top, top side. Top, top side. Tottenham sell Harry Kane by Ivan Tony. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Brentford fans. You know, I have to say this, not just because of the sell-on, but you know and I know he's not going to stay at Brentford forever. Um, he's coming into the prime of his career. He's like that target type man. He can go later in his career. But you've got United are going to need a number nine. Tottenham are going to need a number nine. Um, Chelsea are definitely going to need a number nine. Jesus. Um, and, you know, even Arsenal, if Arsenal win the league, you know, mm-hmm. they've got strikers and players who don't always stay fit. So, and then you've got to think of clubs outside of that. You know, Bayern Munich might need a number nine. So, again, you've got all those things in play. He's going to have a magnificent career, Phil. Um. I also was kind of talking about the um, the England game. I didn't get to see the game yesterday, the Ukraine game, because I don't think it was on the US TV. But I heard a lot of uh, raving reviews about Jude Bellingham. I guess yeah, yeah. he's been playing. What a player! I mean, nineteen. What a player! I mean, that kid's just got the world at his feet. I mean, he could be England's most capped player by the time he finishes mm-hmm. playing. I mean, he's got. If Liverpool sign him, um, 
there's going to be a stiffy in my house. Um, but Liverpool are going to need to sign three of him uh, in the summer. But if Liverpool sign him, look, it, everyone has to stop Man City from signing. Yeah. He cannot sign for Man City. You know, if he signs for Man City, fucking it's game over for the next like four or five years. So, um, so they should all band together, make sure he goes somewhere else. Sorry, Man City fans. Uh, as a Liverpool <laughs> fan, I want together just to stop him from going there. I want him to sign. But going back to the Ivan thing again, yeah. people need to listen to our podcast because this is where I always address the truth. Hence, what's called the hard truth, you know. And people are going, "Oh, you got a million quid? You got a couple yeah. of things I need to clear up." First of all, when is an international appearance in any transfer deal? It's usually a start. Mm-hmm. It has to be a competitive start. Clubs don't usually get paid a fee for a substitution. So that's just one. Yeah. People need to understand how transfers work. Um, a lot of the time, with most deals that are done, particularly in the lower leagues to the higher leagues, is an international cap is anywhere from 250 to 500 grand. That's how it works. Never a million quid. Mm-hmm. Barry was on Talk Sport today because I, I didn't want to go on, so he went on and spoke about it. You know, when we did our deal on Ivan and sold him, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic, we did a deal where we got 6 million plus, plus, and plus up to 10 million. Yeah. And we, we're, we're nearly up now to 10. The final payment, which I agreed in the clauses when we were trying out clauses, and me and Rasmus were going around the houses on it, was it was a million for staying in the Prem. You usually get one year of that. When you do a deal, there's one year of you stay up in the Prem, mm-hmm. you make a big payment or whatever else. I agreed to do another year in there to get amongst it. So whilst we'll max out a 10, plus probably another 10 from the salon, you know, I feel for a 350 grand investment, yep. selling a player during the pandemic with a year left on their contract, that was a pretty good deal. How old so, was he with you? Uh, two years. Mm-hmm. And one of those years was obviously the pandemic year. Yep. Um, so it, it worked really, I'm not, I don't regret anything because if I'd got the international cap, it would have been less than what I actually did the deal for with what we've ended up with where they're going to stay up for a second year in a row. So works for us. So for a deal like that where it caps, so, mm. uh, you know, caps at 10 million, um, that negotiation between your six, you know, of the upfront, or not necessarily upfront, because I'm sure it's still in stage. No, the, the six, was, six was up front. Right. So the six was up front. You're going to try and get 10. How does that negotiation go in terms of what is going to make up? What are, what are the contingencies well, that are going to make up that difference? Well, I, I have an email in, in my Dropbox. When Rasmus first came to see me in the January, it was just before the pandemic kicked off in March. And he actually came and sat with me, uh, brought me a copy of his book. Because he'd been trying to buy Ivan. And we'd been going backwards and forwards in email. And I kept telling him the figure was 10. Mm-hmm. He sent me an email saying, if you ever get 10 million pounds for a player in League One, you should run for prime minister. <laughs> I have the email. So when, when, when we maxed out at it, I was like, what do you think now? Because, I, I, and I remember doing the data at the time and everyone was talking about is it six, is it 10? People were saying, if you got six or 10, you're a liar. There's no way you got that deal. So how it worked was that they were initially offering three yeah. and four because it was the pandemic. Nobody had any money. Everyone was tight and they knew we didn't have any money and League One didn't have any money. But I, I stood for them. And I ended up, um, when I was negotiating, I pinged in the owner of Brentford on the email with Rasmus and spoke about previous strikers Brentford had brought in from Europe who needed six months to acclimatize. Mm-hmm. And Brentford had just missed the playoffs because they'd had slow starts. And my wording in, as a typical salesman goes, Ivan's already ready-made because he's not coming from France. He's not coming from abroad. He could play in the championship tomorrow. He won't need to acclimatize. It will save you six months of acclimatization with another striker and they recruit brilliant strikers. He will go straight in your team. And this time, you'll actually win automatic promotion. Our goal, fight the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And that was my pitch. And I was like, we can argue about this, 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 this. It's 200 million. It's the Premier League. I'm sticking with what I want. The fee, these are the add-ons I want. And then we argued on the add-ons. And this is the set. And that was it. And, and to be fair, they were brilliant. They were brilliant. And they were great. And, and it was just... It was that time during the pandemic because we negotiated in Jan. It didn't go anywhere. The window closed. Mm-hmm. Then the pandemic came. Then it, we went back. They started playing football again in the May or June. I think they lost in the playoffs. And that was around the time Rasmus rang me. And then it all started on email again with the bids. And it was like thinking probably, oh, it's the pandemic. Now we can really. And I was like, no. Yeah. And even though I knew we had no fucking money and we were running on fumes because of the pandemic, we had no income, whatever. It was like being at the poker table with a pair of threes and trying to hold your cool. And I just, 
in the meantime, obviously, Baz was speaking to other clubs, but nobody was coming in with any bids that we wanted. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to... And I spoke to my partners and said, I'm just going to I'm gonna play this close to the line, but we have to be prepared that the way I'm going to do it, it might blow up in our face and then move on. But I stayed at it. So it was just one of them things. So, and again, I'm not trying to take credit. It was what it was. It was a great deal for them. It was a great deal for us. They probably thought at the time it wasn't for them. But mm-hmm. after a year or two years, yep. they're like, it's fucking deal of the century. Um, and again, it's like I always say, you know, there are some amazing players in League One. And it's like players, people will come in for my players in the summer and go, we're not paying that for a League One player. And I go, well, fuck you. Look at Ivan Tony. Mm-hmm. Well, fuck you. This is, you know, look at British on Belonga. We sold for six and he then went for 15 a year later. There are, you know, we've got young players on our team who I have a value on. And it's always been that way. And it'll be no different this summer. You know, some of the players in our squad will play at the very top. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, Jack Taylor is by far the best central midfielder outside the championship. I'm not trying to sell him. He's playing his best football by a country. He shouldn't even be with us. It's a disgrace he's still with us. Um, and he's going to have a career at the time. He could play anywhere he wants. And I have to say, cracking pass for, was it your first goal of the weekend? He, he, he's got an engine in him that's moved up to another level. Another level, and then Efron Clark is just basically he's him. He's just basically like he's come out of nowhere. You know what I mean? The, the scouts watching him are just like, where was he a year ago? Do you know what I mean? So you got to. We spoke about it, the, the yeah. yellow block saying we have no assets and whatever else. Look, we know what we have, and we know what we're going to have, and we're already lined up for the next stage of recruitment and placing players that we're going to have to do business on. Um, it's exciting, and it's when you're winning and doing well, it's exciting seeing the younger players do well. You know, is would you say that Ivan is the best player that's come through kind of the system? Or I mean, you've had some big sales over the no, years. No, I, 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 I've always said to me, Lee Thomas is a player that should have had a Premier League career. Yeah. You know, only Lee will tell you he stopped himself. He got his move to Bournemouth and was probably the size of the fucking, you know, a blimp when he got to Bournemouth for preseason training and whatever. If Lee Tomlin had, had, had stayed focused early on when we sold him, he should have played in the Premier League. For, George Boyd played three or four years in the Premier League, had a Premier League career. Lee Tomlin should have played five, six, seven years. He should have gone again. He should have dominated in the Premier League and he should have got another move. He was still young enough, you know. Talent-wise, I've always said Lee Tomlin. Uh, Ability-wise, all package. Mental strength, Ivan Tony. absolutely. Yeah. Mental strength, just a, a mentality. Klopp likes to say mentality monster. Ivan Tony's a mentality monster. You know, like, gone from here to Newcastle, then he's a nomad. He's on loan seven times. He's you know, fans digging him out for he's, he's not this, he's not that. Mm-hmm. Comes for Peterborough, gets his two years, wins the golden boot, wins player of the year, League One. Gets that move, seizes that move at Brentford, goes again another level, goes to the Premier League. Oh, he'll never make it in the Premier League. Absolutely fucking lutely belong in the Premier League. Goes to England. Can he play for England? Not a problem. Mentality monster. A lot of players have the talent to play as high as they want. They don't have the mentality. That is the difference. You could see a player in League Two 20 years old, you're thinking he could play anywhere. I saw Jack Grealish on loan in Notts County play against mm-hmm. us at 19. I wanted to sign him. You knew he had everything. Maybe off the field, you need to grow up a little bit, play, play anywhere he wants. You could just see it straight away. I see it in some of our young players. Get that mentality right, they can go anywhere they want in the game. So, terrific to see. Like, terrific to see. And, and you know, he, he's going to, like I said, he will get a move. And he will, he'll just surpass a lot, what a lot of people, do you know what I mean? And whatever. So it'll be interesting to see. Big fan there. So what's your feeling on where Republic of Ireland are right now? There's a lot of... Um, oh, hang on. Before uh, we get to that, let's talk, let's talk yeah. Bradford. Let, okay. we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of Bantam fans who, who tune in. Let's talk your beloved club. So you had a game called off why this weekend? What happened? So the, go- the, go- the game was called off for uh, because crew had three players on international duty basically playing kick around football on Lake Como. Um, but crew uh, wanted to postpone it mostly because their, their, their keeper is in England in the twenties, I think. So he's in the, in the twenties, maybe he's on loan. Maybe he's, I don't know whether he's on loan or whether he's um, their player or not, but he was the first team keeper. So they were able to get the game called off. Now they had a game on Tuesday, which they didn't have called off um, and lost but uh, apparently they weren't allowed to request that one off because it had already been rearranged, um, something right. like that. So they had to play on Tuesday, so they were able to get ours called off. Um, you which, feel salty about that? You know, it's frustrating. Um, it's probably going to be rescheduled for the last week of the season. Um, so we'll be, you know, trying to get games in. It seem, it's just curious, you know, for me, crew aren't going anywhere. 
there there were 1800 tickets sold you know we're going to fill it out now they're going to have to give refunds and it just seems like a curious kind of business decision but so they're not going up they're not going down no um i forget forget where they are in the uh the table i should have a look here but they've uh I, I don't expect there was much at stake for them um where are they i mean they're 19th but so the 10 points adrift so i guess they're closer than they would like to be okay to, but okay yeah it's one of them so, isn't it? it's, it's like look i guess any club will use something to their advantage if it's in mm-hmm. their advantage so i can't i can't playing devil's advocate i can't knock that if they've mm-hmm. had a bad defeat midweek they need a bit of a rest. There's a running coming up. They're 10 points yeah. off, you know, or, you know, there's still a little bit of nervousness. From your perspective, maybe you needed to break after all the draws. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, I mean, it's been kind of frustrating with all the draws. How'd Just... the Carlisle game go? Game go? Did, you, did you do well? Yeah, that was a, a curious one. So that one was nil-nil. Um, but it was, a, it was a good advert for League Two. You know, two teams pretty much having a go at each other. Um, both having chances. They hit the post last kick of the game, you know, 95th minute. We Your arsehole collapsed. <laughs> it, was, it was an ex-City player who him and his dad are always giving it the verbals oh, to us no. on social media. <laughs> and he scored against us before. Oh, um, so that we all have those been, players. That would have been just yeah. typical. <laughs> his dad would have been in, you know, in heaven if he yeah. scored that one. God. But um, I think we probably deserve to win, but uh, I mean, I've got no, aside from the str- frustration of feeling like another couple of points dropped, um, it was probably fair. Did the results go against you at the weekend? Um, we had, uh, let's see, so yeah, Northampton won, Salford beat Stevenage. Good That's win. kind of 50-50, depending on whether you're going playoffs or whether you're going for automatics. Carlisle lost uh, to Gillingham, which was a good result for us. Stockport won, Mansfield drew. So it's a bit all over the map, really. Who's next up? We have Grimsby at home next. Okay. Are they in good form, Grimsby? Um, let's have a look. What they're... Um, uh, try to find them in the table here. Mixed. Two wins. Two, well, two draws, two wins, a defeat. Okay. Few games. So they've been a little bit over the place. We have had uh, four draws in a row. And then two wins before that. Okay. So we are now six points off automatic. Still there. Uh, and three points above Mansfield in the last playoff spot. We're in the last playoff spot with a game in hand over most of the ones that are in the playoffs. So you got nine games left? Yes. Okay. Well, there it is. It's there. So it's, it's now time to put the afterburners on. Let's yeah. see, uh, let's see the, the, the fitness step up and whatever. So... Going, going back to the international thing about Republic of Ireland, they had a good win last week. Uh, I think, are they playing today? Uh, France, I think they're playing. Um, so they, they had a good uh, win. I don't know, it was a, I think it was a friendly. They won 3-2. Some young mm-hmm. players. They got the young boy Ferguson from uh, Brighton, who's now yeah. on their team scoring goals. Um, their, front, their attacking players are getting younger. I've always said this. There's too many experienced veterans in the team. Like I look at, I look at England and Southgate, and I'm looking at uh, Trippier. And I'm looking at Carl Walker and players like that and going, well, in, in two years or whenever the next Euros is, you know, they're what going to be 33, 34, 35. You've so many talented young players. You know, at what mm-hmm. stage do you, you know, even Jordan Henderson, at what stage do you step yeah. them down and move past them, you know? So in the Irish team, I guess it would be the same. Why have you still got players in their mid-30s playing who mm-hmm. in a year are going to be even a year worth all? So um, the manager's growing on me. I know the way he wants to play is a certain style. Um it's a tough group to get out of. I looked at the group. They got France in that group. Who else have they got in that group? There's Holland. Greece, is it, no, uh, is it? Greece Gibraltar, Netherlands. Yeah, France. Netherlands, Holland, yeah. yeah. So you got Greece, Holland, and France. So, you know, they're going to have to beat France. They're going to have to pull a miracle off and win. win. I think it's at home. They're going to have to beat France um, to, to get it all started really well. Um, he's got them playing better. Um, if they have some belief, they've got some good young players in there. Good goalkeeper. They have got some good defenders. Good attackers. Midfield. I'd worry a little bit about. I would say in a year's time, Jack Taylor would be in that midfield by country mile. Um, yeah, I'm not sure with these Euros. Definitely the 26 World Cup. Mm-hmm. If we if we move on from some of the old guard, I think we'll be in that World Cup. I'm not sure on these Euros. There's a lot of hype around Ferguson right now, isn't there? Great young player. Great young player. 
Um, you know, but we had that before with the other Brighton kid. What's his name? Who ended up going on loan for the champ? Um, uh, fucking my, my mind scrambled. He scored against us in the Brighton under 21s. He played mm-hmm. for Ireland, scored against Spurs. He went on loan to Middlesbrough. And now he, he went to Italy. Um, he is Irish, but it just he's, he's lost his way the last couple of years. Um, Aaron Connolly, Aaron Connolly, sorry, there's the name. Well done, partner. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's he's kind of like he, he came on the scene. I think Fergus is a better prospect. Um, no, I think they're they're in a good spot there up front. So yeah, you know, don't forget we Grealish and Rice nicked off as by England. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know they, they could have been playing for Ireland. I mean, it would have made a hell of a difference to the midfield. I'm talking about right. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. I you were going to ask me a question. Where do we rank? I think Scotland are ahead of us. Mm-hmm. Wales shouldn't be because I think Wales has got a lot of old players still that they're transitioning from young old to young. You know, Bale has still got Aaron Ramsey involved. He's still got like a few of the other old guard. Northern Ireland, we should be above. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know where we are in the world rankings, but if you ask me by 2026, where will we be? I would say it's going to be England, Scotland, Ireland, Republic of Ireland. Yeah, it's like you're 49 right now. Yeah, yeah. Are we above Northern Ireland? Um, let's have a look. Northern Ireland 59, so you are above, yeah. I, by the looks of it anyway, quick. I think by, 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 by 2026, we can go above Wales, and I think we can start going above Scotland with mm-hmm. the, the, the young talent we've got coming through, without a doubt in my mind. So it is what it is. Look, we're, we're, we're the rugby world number one with the Grand Slam champions. I'll take there you that go. <laughs> <laughs> you got to cling on to something. Yeah, yeah, well, fuck it. It's a big thing to cling on to, you cunt. <laughs> I do Depends what you think about rugby, I suppose. What about you boys, you know what I mean? So, like, listen, I was a rugby player at a young age, so I still think a lot of it. So, no, it is what it is. So, yeah, um, England obviously are what they are. Um, they're going to win their group. They're going to go to the Euros. Depends what group they have. I, I look at the England squad every time. I think they should win a championship. Mm-hmm. Do they have the manager? We'll see it in other tournaments yeah. next year. But... If, that, if, if it runs for them and they get to a level where they should win it and they don't, then you've got to ask questions for the World Cup. Yeah, it's they have to jump up to... The, there's there's an, one gear that they haven't stepped up into and they've got to step up to that gear. Correct, correct. So, you know, should have beaten France in the last World Cup. Mm-hmm. They should have progressed. Um, you, they, for me, they have to make the finals of the Euros, you know, this time. But, you know... They've got a lot of talent in that squad. They've got a lot of good young players. You know what I mean? They're only going to get better. Um, th- there's no weakness in the England team. People talk about centre back, but you, you know, you, behind Stones and Maguire, you've got young players. You know, coming through. Like it's a, I say, I don't think they've got weakness. I think mm-hmm. England's going to be strong for a long time. And I think like there are some players who are better than the players already in the team. The number yeah. one, you know, I would argue is that Nick Pope. Is that you mm-hmm. know Ramsdale? You know, and, and right back, again, I would argue, you know, who should be, you know, Luke Shaw or should it be, you know, Chilwell. So you you look at certain things in the team. I, England are stacked all over the place. Um, they got strikers coming out of the rears. They got, yeah, I, I, I don't worry about them. So interesting. You know, in some ways it's hard, but it's, it's easier when you know that you're, um, you know, the striker should be these three players. Your forward player should be these three. Or, you know, you kind of have it set and it almost makes it easier to... 100%. Um, you know, now it's about fitting in the players, looking at form, looking at... Formations. Um, well, yeah. Gareth Southgate doesn't look at form, does he? I mean, uh, Calvin Phillips played the other day and I think he's only played 15 minutes yeah. of football all season. So he doesn't... He seemed a bit desperate, did that. You know, Ward Prowse is like one of the best central midfielders in the Premier League and he, mm-hmm. you know, you've got Phillips in above him because that's a trust thing. That's a manager. That's... I'm playing the players I know. And and that's sometimes dangerous because that's disheartening to players who come in and go, I want a chance. I'm playing every week. I'm I'm, I'm pulling up trees and this guy sat on the bench every week, but he still gets in. So if that's what you're telling me, then it doesn't matter what I do. You know, it would be like Harry Kane not scoring for 15 games, falling off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Ivan Tony's leading in the golden boot stakes and Kane's still in the team. Yeah. Why? Based on history. You know, I've always said this, history doesn't pay the bills. Mm-hmm. Truth. So where else? Um, what else have we got going on? So um, obviously uh, Antonio Conte got sacked. Or Rightly so. Sent like, we, uh, like us and I think the whole world expected him to do after his rounds uh, a week got or so. Got us paid out. Yeah, got us paid uh, out. Everton have allegedly breached the financial fair play rules. Who hasn't at this stage? Yeah. Um, I'm going to help them. 
Man United, have you been watching the uh, the the bids process play out for uh, for yeah. United over the last few days? Yeah, it's. I'm not sure that you know, just somebody come up with the money and buy the club. You know, I'm I'm, I'm dreading it as a Liverpool fan. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're just going to have more money. Now we're going to be dealing with Man City, Newcastle, and now Man United reinvigorated with loads of money. Or if we're going to win the Premier League, which is going to make Cronky, who's already one of the wealthiest people in the world, spend even more money. So now Liverpool have got like a bigger hill to climb yeah. because we just don't have that kind of wealth behind us that, that that's going to go into the club. Um, that's not a dig on the owners. That's just who they are. And fair enough. Um, the Qataris, I would imagine, would end up doing that deal um, if they want it. Yeah. That's, a, that's the only question, isn't it? If they wanted to Radcliffe and all the wealth he's yeah. got and whatever, I, I don't think anyone who's British can match the wealth of the Qataris right. or the people behind that, where they're getting the money from. I think they want to buy it outright. They want to clear all the debt. They want to pay off transfer debt out. They want to do training, ground, stadium. Anyone who's buying that club, what's the sweet spot? Is it worth five and a half, six? Probably not, but because it's iconic, you're going to have to pay 5.5, 5.6. You would never put a bid at 5.5 five because it would be like too obvious. You'd go in at like 5.65, 5.65 five, mm-hmm. billion. I always put a strange yeah, they, number at the end, so it makes it correct. look like they uh, so, thought of calculation in a spreadsheet rather than just bringing in. So say, say, say five and a half billion, they're going to have to spend another half a billion on training ground and new players recruitment, that's six billion. And then they're probably going to have to spend a bill, a bill point two on a state-of-the-art stadium. So really it's a seven billion pound deal, isn't it? You know, all in all. But at the end of it, you're going to have probably 100,000 capacity Mm-hmm. You know, one of the best stadiums in England. Yeah. You're going to have an iconic brand that will start winning titles and Champions Leagues again. And in 15 years' time, that seven billion is probably going to be worth 15 billion mm-hmm. because that's how sports franchises are going. Uh, the turnover for United and as a business, it's actually it'll probably be end up being seven billion well spent, yeah. in my opinion. I get everyone's going on about it's the Qataris, it's the money, it's human rights. The usual, the journalists are going to write their articles. Everyone's going to be up in arms, and then they're going to go and go to a World Cup and take their paychecks for reporting on it all. Um, and everyone's going to get their knickers and they're not. It's the real world we live in. Um, when you have an asset you want to sell, if somebody's buying your house and you and your wife put your house up for sale and three people come and bid, mm-hmm. and one of them is a serial killer who's been released from prison after 30 years and they want to give you 25% more money than the other person, be fucking honest, Phil, even though you're a you know climate-loving Democrat, you're going to take the 25% more. You know, I'm not going to be Googling them. I'm going to be just looking at them uh, spending more money on my house and the deal's a deal. Like I said, you're going to take more money. Yeah. You don't care if it's like, you don't care if it's Jack the Ripper buying your place. You don't care about the record and whatever else. Yeah. And that's just the way business works. Yeah. Um, I get the arguments about sports washing. I get the the, the the constant stuff on articles. I just wish all these journalists and media were just as strong on China, you know, and, and what they do out there and the human rights and the stuff, you know, and they're not... They're always, it's the one area, it's Qatar, it's the UAE, it's, it's whatever else. It's, it's never really about China, never about what they've done, and we've all seen what they've done. Um, so it's always an inconsistent argument for me. At the end of the day, your articles aren't going to shape who buys Man United. The owners of Man United, who own the 70%, the Glazers, are going to sell to the highest bidder. The people who own the other 30% in public shares and whatever else, again, it's on stock market. They will sell their yeah. shares to the highest bidder. It's just the way yeah. it works. And the owners have a fiduciary duty to maximize the value that they get for the, the asset, essentially. I mean, that's a legal responsibility. Right. So there's ways to look at it, skin the cat and whatever else, but they will come in and they will, uh, the wealth they'll put into that club, like I said to you, and they're not doing it basically because they're fans. They're doing it because they're shrewd and they have, mm-hmm. they have access to money, oodles of money, and they want to buy prime assets that in 15, 20 years' time are going to appreciate. You know, it's, it's, that's just the way yeah. business operates. It's the same with a hedge fund in America putting $4 billion into Chelsea to buy it, to buy players, to reshape it, to buy other clubs. Because again, in 15 years' time, when they sell out or whatever they do, it, the, the, the exit signs are, it's going to be a profit. You know, so everyone needs to put their big boy pants on and just understand that this is capitalism. This is the way it works. This is a business. And very rarely would an owner take a lower offer based on the background of the people buying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hard truth, and, baby. And so Huddersfield have also been taken over this week. So the so the ex-chairman, then part-chairman, Dean Hoyle, bought the rest of the club back so then he could flip yeah. 
uh, the club to an American consortium who I'm not sure have been named. Or, uh, I, I, I'd, been... I'd heard about this deal a few weeks ago from someone I knew who's in the 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 that game, that side mm-hmm. of it, who, who, who deals with buyers and whatever else. All I can say is, is he's one of the best owners ever, Dean Hoyle. Yeah. He's brilliant for the EFL, brilliant for Huddersfield. You know, he's had, I think, health issues yep. um, over the last few years. God bless him. And if this is good for him, his health and his family, because it's not a monetary decision, I guarantee Dean Hoyle would have put Huddersfield, we're talking about you're selling to the highest bidder. Yeah. He would be the exception to the rule because he's a fan, he's a hometown guy, and he would just be doing a deal for the benefit of the actual club and its fans more yeah. so than him. He's all very, he's very wealthy independently yeah. of, of that football club. So I would wish him nothing but the best. Uh, absolutely fantastic owner. Yeah, it's it's hard to say as a Bradford fan, but you know you look at Dean Hoyle and he's a kind of owner that every club Excellent honor. Um, would Excellent wish. Honor. And, Absolutely. You know he probably realized. I mean, he sold last time because of health issues. He, he probably looks back and has some regrets about what happened since he did that, and he wants to make yeah, sure he had no choice. I I, I yeah. think he was in a bad way. And if your health's at you, and I don't know if that's returned or whatever it is, you know he's got family, he's got kids, he's got whatever. You know your health is like that. You can't football drains you. Football, the stress, what it can do to your body and your health, if your health's already in a bad way. Um, I absolutely like understand what he's doing and why he's doing it, but he's going to do it for the benefit of the club and its fans, not him or his family. That's the type mm-hmm. of guy he is. Fair play to him. Um, so hopefully the, another American owner's coming in to join many more. Um, hopefully they're good owners, and that's all yeah. you can ask for, because you yeah. just constantly see stuff all the time in the press. You were going to bring up another club at an issue this week, no? Uh, Wigan. Wigan couldn't pay their. Uh, who knows what's going on at Wigan? I, I don't get it because I, I I believe their owner they won the league. I think he had money. He has money. You know the fans loved them. Uh, I, obviously, everyone was in the summer a bit surprised when they went up that they didn't really sign anybody. It was all a bit. There weren't signings coming in. There wasn't a lot of activity. You know, I I I, I can't comment. He's missed payday. You know, whatever else. But he, on his track record of taking him out of I think administration out of trouble. You know, getting them promoted, putting the money up to do it. Um, obviously, he's having a hard time. I don't know. It's down to him to come out and tell people. Um, but yeah, they've obviously got hit with three points. And I saw the players. Did they down tools or stop training? Yeah, they stopped training, I think, last week. Strange one for me, because as we know in the game, no matter what happens to a club, as long as they don't completely go out of business, because of the football rule on debt, out the footballers and clubs and mm-hmm. whatever else, the players, they'll get paid. Yeah. If we can went into administration, whatever the players will still get paid. It doesn't help players now with their mortgages. It doesn't help them, whatever. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, it's the players' prerogative to down tools. I get it. I understand. But they're fighting a relegation. You know, maybe you'd prefer the players to come out in a group and a captain and go, you know what? We've been fucked around. We're not happy with ownership. We're not happy with what's happened. But it's our duty for the fans. We're going to fucking do our best. You know, the PFA can step in also and help. The PFA can provide loans. So it's not like they're going to go without. Just to say, you know what? We're not down until we're going to. We've we've got a job in hand. We've got eight nine games to go. We're going to give it our best shot to stay in this fucking league, and hopefully, then the owner can fucking sell to somebody who can pay our wages on time. Yeah. So there's two it, two ways you can do it. That's like one of the lot of the Bolton players did. I seem to remember when they were going through their situation. Yeah, there's there's ways to handle it and ways not to. Cost of living crisis and whatever else. I guess as players, you have to be careful because you're not going to garner sympathy, you know, for having a few late paydays. I don't think any of them are owed any wages. I don't think it's a case of six months without being paid. I think it was just missed. So as players earning five figures a week or whatever else, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe they could have got better advice on how to handle it. Mm-hmm. If I'm wrong about this and they didn't do that, then I apologize. I don't want salacious headlines saying that we're hammering the Wigan players. We're not. I'm just saying maybe there's another way they could have gone. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, footballers are going to get paid with the road. Yeah. We got uh, a couple of questions. So let's sure. go there. So... Andrew, uh, who sent a question on email, a question about managerial hirings. Could Daryl yes. give some insight on the process? So you often hear people say, a certain manager has three promotions on his CV. Do managers really have CVs or how do yes. they apply for roles? Yes, agents usually send CVs for managers and they do have CVs. Mm-hmm. It will be history where they started. They will have their achievements. It's never about, they'll never have their disappointments on the <laughs> CV. You know, really achievements. You do your Those own thing. happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, it's agents. I get hammered. I've been since Darren arrived day one and said, you know, it was the end of the season. I've every week I've got agents going, I've got the manager for you. I've got this. And I'm just really direct when they put a name and I'll just go, Yeah, not for me. Not interested. You know, and, and like I said, when I go to the UK, 
they're conversations I have to have. Um, speak to the, and, I, and again, I don't want to disrespect the current manager. Yeah. I have to do that when I'm in the UK and I'm going over the middle of April for four weeks. Um, and there'll be all conversations I'll have then. And I didn't want to get involved in all of that furor and, and hoo-ha and, you know, rumors and nonsense. If you read anything in a paper about Peterborough looking the hardest person, do not believe it. I have not had a conversation with anybody about, I like that manager. I want this manager. I want my current manager. Did it, did it, did it. I have not had those conversations. I took the approach in January, as you quite know, and I, keep, mm-hmm. I fill you in on lots of stuff, is take the team gaff, get everything sorted. Let me do the work behind the scenes. Let me get the club in a better place. You know, and then the end of the season, that's a conversation everyone has to have. And I have to look at who's the new manager going to be, who's the new CEO going to be, how are we going to do this and do it methodically and properly. I don't want any problems like we've had over the last year or whatever else. I want to do things properly and we're going to do things properly. So don't believe any shite you read because I have not spoke to one person about the Peterborough United job and I won't. So a job comes up. So a job comes up and you basically have an inbox full of CVs from agents and then hundred percent they're doing the job you and calling you and yeah and to be, you basically uh, and to be fair I've had a few managers directly reach out to me yeah you know because I've, I I know a lot of managers I Does know there a lot make of people. difference Does, is there any difference whatsoever in where the approach comes from yeah uh, no it makes no difference to me it could be a manager with an agent it could be a manager on its own at the end of the day not all managers have agents but I've had you know I've had about six seven managers directly reach out you know first it'd be Oh, you're doing great. How are you? And then a couple of days later, oh, by the way, you know, keep me in mind, consider me, da 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 da. It's the way it goes. It's the business, you know. Um, it's tough out there. Like I've always said to you, there's only 72 jobs in the EFL, mm-hmm. you know, and then 20, obviously, in non league. It's, it's not an easy game to be in. Well, you know, when I was, I was saying to you, I was at the US camp yesterday, my pal Anthony's like the man in charge of America at the moment. And, you know, we were talking about him, his future, what he's doing. He was the 21s now. He's kind of running things for the US national team until they hire a new manager. And he was just like, you know, he's lived in Chicago. He's lived in America side. He's managed the MLS. He was like, it's tough out there. And I said, no, you're damn right. It is tough out there. You've got managers like my manager with loads of promotions. And there probably wasn't a stack of jobs in the intro. Yeah. You know, you've got other managers the same. And, and you get forgotten about it very quickly. And sometimes you get managers to get jobs they don't deserve because they have a good agent. Mm-hmm. And the agent, basically, you know, the owner or the agent has, has got his hooks into a club. And you're like, how the fuck did he get that job? Yeah. Some managers get four or five of them. I've said this in the past, and you're like, what the fuck? So it's just, you know, great agent. Uh, it could work that way. So a question from Gareth uh, also came across on email. With recent news, uh, like Hull proposing to buy Dundalk, what's your opinion on big oh, English clubs buying smaller clubs? I, I, I didn't I didn't know Hull were uh, buying uh, Dundalk. I'm going to Google that while we're talking. Yeah, Dund- Dundalk's, is, Dundalk's like, you know, one of the superpowers in Ireland for the last few years. That they've been... I thought Dundalk was owned by an American guy who already had multi-club ownership. Or, 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 or guy. Uh, it says, Dundalk and Hull City Investments put on ice. The oh, English okay. club are also weighing up an interest in Dundalk's League of Ireland rivals, Shelbourne. Ah, okay. Well, I, I, I love it. I've been trying to do it since the pandemic, the multi-club yeah. ownership thing. I, I went and I worked during the pandemic and went abroad, even the UAE, everywhere, trying to raise money to do um, multi-club ownership. I believe in it. I set up a whole thing. We we're going to buy like 10 clubs because with, with our policy and our recruitment and the statistical mm-hmm. analysis of data center, everything we were going to build and the way I was going to, I had it all put together. It was all going to be run in sync. And it would be, you know, Peter would have a sister club in France vice versa in, in Holland and Italy, the management styles, the technical directors at recruitment level, and we could produce, we would have investors produce returns for them, have successful clubs getting promoted, sell one, buy another one after that. Again, a return to investors and, and really work the system in a good way, but an effective way across all those clubs with their academies, everything would be in sync. I still want to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm speaking about with partners, including my current partner, um, about the summer, about and someone else I know about potentially quick couple of ones, the the Irish league, maybe the Scottish league. And then we've got, then we're going to obviously bring on other investors and then look to Belgium, Denmark, Holland, uh, Portugal, lower league clubs. I want to do it. And Mm -hmm. I think it will be the next stage of my career as an owner. Um, I'm not saying Peter is going to be part of that, by the way, that might be separate. Yep. You know, this could be a completely separate thing. I'm still, in, I'm still allowed on Peterborough and whatever else. We're not in the same leagues. We're not going to be in Europe competing against each other just yet. Um, so, no, really interested. I'm building a thing about that dinner for the summer. 
So yeah, anyone out there who wants to come on board and has got a few quid, we're open to it. You know, it'd be my money, other people's money. So the way to do it, it's, it's exciting. And, and I can see it get done. And I have in my mind a, right, a roadmap. And I was right because in COVID, there were clubs I'd done deals to buy in advance um, who've since been flipped for three times the price I had deals yeah. to buy them for. So I was absolutely correct about it. And it's not just about making money. It's a sports thing, but ultimately it comes down to money because that's why people invest. Uh, and, so, and, is yeah. that, and is that the business mo model from an investment perspective is more around the club valuation as opposed to moving assets uh, around and giving moving players around and giving them opportunities to play? It's, a, it's, a, it's everything. I think if you, own, if you own a Premier League club and like Man City and have a, a football group, it's everything. It's about utilizing the coaches, the managers, the players, the recruitment, getting your fingers into the best pies in, in new in football industries. India is another one where you want to be in early and you want to have a club and you want to get involved. And, you know, you can get the best talent then into your club in the UK. You can do cross deals. You know, you can you can have a club in France and you your club in England will buy the player from France. Mm -hmm. The club in France obviously gets its money. There's a sell-on. The club in England then, it does well. It sells the player. France gets a sell-on. You move. There's loads of ways to do it. You could have players here with an Irish club when they play a different time of the year. So I could take seven, eight of our younger players who weren't in the first team yet and stick them out on loan in Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, I think you can only play five, but I would put them out there. You would have coaches who go every year to seminars and courses and, and your clubs all play to a certain system, a certain way, a certain philosophy. So that when your players do yeah. join on loan or cross uh, fit, they're used to the coaching, they're used yeah. to the formation, they're used to the style. I, I just see it as an evolution. I would have, based on how we recruit, we would have it on a grander scale with a technical director over a load of football directors mm -hmm. and a scouting department that would be based on a lot of statistical analysis. I even have where I put the HQ for that hub in the engine. I would all figure it out. I still haven't figured it out. So I, I just think it, it, it could be massive. And it could be, you know, for people involved, investors, owners, whatever, you're going to get dividends. You're going to, get, you know, you're going to do okay out of it, but you're going to have the football factor enjoyment. Because the idea being is the clubs you buy, you're going to buy them in lower divisions and get them to the top divisions. Yeah. So there's a, there's a fun ride as part of the process. Don't say trust the process, part of the process. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's something I, I'm very passionate about and something I want to do. How, how, much, how much money does something like that oh, take lot. to oh, lot. Oh, lot. together? A lot. I was at the time to do the 10 clubs. I was, I was about 200 million I wanted to raise. Mm -hmm. Um. To the start off smaller and you want to get three or four clubs and whatever else, probably around 30, 40 million because you have to buy clubs, then you have to operate and cost you. Yeah. You know, I set it up in a way where, where the clubs were run without any contribution for the first two years because the contribution was in the initial pie you raised. Yeah. By year three, each club would sell an asset every year to maintain it and, and do what needed to be done. But no, the whole mechanism would work very, very smoothly. And you're probably looking at clubs that are previously underinvested. 100%. Uh, with, which is run down. Years, but requires that, a investment. Historically good clubs, second division, even third division in some of the bigger countries that are down on their luck. I've been at the shit kicked out of them. You clear the debt, you go in, you give them purpose, you give them recruitment, you give them a plan, you go through the motions, you get promoted, you know, the facilities, the training ground, stadium plays, all those things. That there's, yeah, that there's a massive play there and lots of people are trying to do it. So I don't want to be last at the party, but it is something I'm going to do because I think I could do it. I think it could be the best well oils run machine you've ever seen in your life. People will go, yeah, but Posh, you did it there. I'm going, yeah. Uh, you know, of course I want more for Posh. Of course I wanted to achieve more with Posh and whatever. I'm constantly trying. That dream isn't over, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, I will get that right, you know. So, but other clubs, other areas and crowd bases and everything you look at, I, I just think it's an exciting prospect. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much, as always, for your time today. Let's wrap things up cool. there. And just a reminder to anybody, send any questions that you have along. You can do it through just going to uh, hardtruthfootball.com slash contact, or you can uh, tweet us, send us notes uh, on social media Brilliant. or anything like that. Um, and we'll pose those to Dara. So uh, good have stuff. a good week. You too, Mama. Enjoy the game tonight, and I'll yeah. catch up with you after the weekend. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Cheers, guys. Take care.